G'day guys, uh, Adam Kogan here for a very, very special episode of Ask Me Anything at NDC Sydney. How are you, Richard? I'm well, Fred. How are you? Fred? I said friend. Oh, Fred. <laughs> I thought you forgot my name. <laughs> What's your name again? So, this is weird. I'm sitting in the wrong seat. This is not how this is supposed to work. Do you actually ever sit in the other seat where you're going to be asked questions? Relatively rarely. Mm. Well, compared to the number of times I'm sitting in that seat, yeah, nice. not so much. Awesome. So we've known each other for more than 20 years. More than 20 years. We've done, we've done so many conferences, had mm -hmm. so many late nights, climbed Kilimanjaro. We did. Fuji, lots of fun things. Yep. You're one of the smartest people I know. Ah. What's the meaning of life? Uh, 42. <laughs> That's someone else's meaning. That was a pretty good meaning for me as well. <laughs> okay. So I've got a heap of questions here. Um, you've done um, a lot of stuff. You... Um, what was it like growing up in Canada? You know, did you pull apart a lot of the things? Yeah, I was always a hardware guy. My father is an electrical engineer. Mm -hmm. He built cash registers. So, I mean, I, I think I desoldered my first circuit board at six years old. You know, electronics was always a normal part of my life, just something, something to do. But, I, you know, the joke is I was kind of an outdoorsy kid, a lot of sailing and fishing and hiking, and that, that's what I was like as a kid. And, uh, but, yeah, always with an electronics bent. That's how I got into computers so early. I was actually in a Radio Shack buying parts, and there was a TRS-80 there. They, they'd just gotten it, and I started playing with it and pretty much didn't leave. And were you a good student at high school? Did you enjoy high school? No, I was bored to death in high school. I, I was writing code on the side. Uh, I actually finished my last two years of high school living on my own. Uh, I was making money off of programming, and, uh, but I figured it was kind of dumb not to graduate, so I kept going anyway but maybe about half time. So I got mediocre marks, but I could pass. I, I was one of those guys that got like low marks in the classroom, but aced the exams. So I knew the stuff, I just found school tedious. I had other things to do. So did the minimum necessary to graduate when I was programming for a living by then. Right, and, and at which point did it hit you that you love learning? Uh, I've always loved learning. I just didn't care for school. So that, you know, that was never a, an issue for me. I read really fast, so I was an obsessive reader since I was, I don't know, single digits. And, uh, and so that, that was just a normal part of my life, was reading technical things and research papers. I've always done that. So I know that you came from humble beginnings, mm -hmm. didn't go to university. Mm -mm. How, did, how would have your life turned out differently had you gone to a private school, gone to a good university? Funny you should ask that because uh, when I was about 12, uh, my mother got an offer basically to send me to a private school uh, for uh, a path in physics. I had uh, gotten top score on a physics thing and so forth. I found atomic physics pretty straightforward and so they, they did make that offer. I just didn't want to go and she couldn't make me. So I didn't go. I, so if I, had, I suspect if I had done that, I'd be a physicist. Any regrets? Nope, not a bit. I love what I do. Wow. I'm also very aware, like, I'm a researcher by nature. Like, that's, you know, if you think about my role with .NET Rocks and so forth, it's about thinking about what developers need to know six to nine months from now. I love research. If I had gone to university, I never would have come out. I would have been, I would have been the guy in the stacks. You never see me. You just ask questions, and I produce answers. And I would have been happy. I really, I would have enjoyed that. I'm still prone to that today. But uh, no, that's not the path I ended up going on. When you say prone to it, do you mean in those geek out sessions you do on Dr. Yeah, Ross? so the geek outs are a therapy for me, right? I'm researching anyway, so the geek outs are about assembling a bunch of information to tell a story over an hour. I always assemble the information, but the discipline to actually make the story, that's the harder work. University students today are very different. They purchase iPads, mm -hmm. they purchase laptops that are ready to go. There was a study that came out um, with graduates of 2015, and it said 80% of the students of computer science had never installed an operating system. Yeah, that's kind of an archaic concept today. Operating systems just aren't that important, right? Like, what, why would you? Does it matter that they're not pulling apart things or um, knowing how it all 
stop them. I mean, it's, that's, but that's the same argument as why aren't you shooting your own food and cleaning your own you know, game? <laughs> it really is. It's the same argument. They, an advancement of society breaks apart individual skills. The, the process of making smaller and smaller computing devices, the side effect of that is they're not maintainable. And they're, the only way to take them apart is to pour them acetone on them to separate the glue. We want them smaller, lighter, faster, cheaper, and the side effect of that is they're not maintainable. We're, cars are like that too. Today, cars are way more reliable than they were back when we could maintain them. The side effect of making them incredibly reliable is we took away their maintainability. And same with electronics. You're a mentor to many, many people. Mm. And you can see walking around the conferences, love, people love listening to .NET Rocks. They probably think that they know you're listening to you. Tell me uh, a couple of mentors for you. Oh, wow, okay. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I've had a few. Uh, I mean, I'm old now, so but, but many of them passed on. So one of the most influential people in my life was one of my first business partners, a guy named Lionel Shapiro. And he, uh, very Jewish, it was, it, I was in my 20s, he was in his 60s, so big spread. We met at a, uh, a, a bailiff shop. So this was in the 1980s when businesses were going broke and lots of stuff was being repossessed. And so the bailiff shop is what all the gear would get resold. So I was making good money pulling computer equipment out of the bailiff because they didn't know what it was, reconditioning it and reselling it. So just because it's often they pull it out, they damage it or they didn't know how to turn it on. Like you'd have no idea what the value was. And Lionel was like the only other guy who knew what this business was. And he had enough money that we, but we went on on a couple of big buys of equipment together, reconditioned them, got them up running. And he was kind of staggered by me because I could repair the hardware as well as program it. So we got a lot of value. So we kind of went back and forth and ended up in a partnership. It was a good business. His background was accounting. He's the guy who held my feet to the fire on return on investment. You know, it's easy for software people to fall in love with the problem, right? That we love programming. Like, don't, the last thing we'd want to do is finish a program because then it would be taken away from us. And he was always the guy that pushed me on, do the most valuable thing. Like, how are you providing value to the customer? What's the return on investment? How do we get value from that? And in that time when Money was really tight, you know, it was a, it was a recession in the, in the 80s. The, we could go into a company and say, look, we'll save you money. We'll actually make you more efficient. You spend money with us and you'll get that money paid back in just a few months. We made a good business that way and it affected pretty much everything I've done going forward. So he taught you about the importance of return on investment mm -hmm. and making money? Well, based, yeah, what does real money look like? You know, how do you really earn out, right? Once you work on return on investment mindsets, you stop worrying about what you're paid. You worry more about the value you provide. And often in software, we provide huge amounts of value to people that we may not even realize many times the value of what we're actually paid for our work. That's why the software industry has been tolerated for the number of failures that it has. You know, this whole, and I don't think it's true anymore, but back when like 50% of projects would fail, well, that's insane. You imagine 50% of bridges fall down? Like, it's just not reasonable. <laughs> but we got away with it because when you got it right, the value was huge. It was 10 times, 100 times return. And you were paid a wage for that. So once you start getting into your head, the real value you provide, you price your services differently. You, you, pri you price your compensation differently and you make more money because you make more money for other people. So I just heard a story just um, downstairs where a guy had left a company because he had implemented a system that had saved the company uh, several million dollars, so mm -hmm. he's told, and he got a thousand dollar bonus for it. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't too happy about that. Well, you know, sometimes you have to structure the right deal too. And part of this problem is that we, we have conversation about technology rather than have conversations about business value, right. about solutions. So my, my early mentors, that's what they pushed me on and, and got me much more focused on, on the value proposition of what we can do with technology rather than the technology itself. Can I push you for another mentor that maybe, because you've met so many people through Microsoft, mm -hmm. so many people th like at, at all the conferences, you've met so many technology people. Have you got a technology mentor? You know, I, a technology mentor, I don't know. I mean, there's lots of people, because I have a very personal thought around, you know, a, a mentor-mentee relationship is a very personal thing. You've got to interact very closely. 
and I was in so early. I mean, my father, in some respects, was a mentor because he he made me think about electronics and, and how to work with technology. But he was happy in discrete electronics. He didn't really want to go into microcomputers. So I, I sort of went my own way on all right. of that. But I was so well read mm -hmm. on most technologies that they, that I didn't. I, I mostly got mentored about business. Right. Okay. Know? The tech I had. Okay. That wasn't the problem. Doing good things with it, that was the problem. So uh, I wouldn't mind asking about important moments in your life. Mm -hmm. um, I have, when I think there's so many important moments in my life that have been um, awesome. Actually, one of them was with you. Mm -hmm. And I don't even know if you'll remember, but I think it was back in 1998, VB5 was out. Yep. VB6 was just coming out. And um, you and Stephen Forte were doing... Um, uh, a presentation and you were throwing tennis balls back to each other mm -hmm. and you had one uh, com dll you know vb dll right we were doing marshalling as i recall yes basically you'd made that one emit some hate, uh, some X, uh, xml yep you'd have the other system consuming that mm -hmm. while you were throwing tennis balls back each time you did it because right. it was such a foreign concept and then i go oh great so we can have one system call another and then it continues on it's kind of and we would take all the tennis balls, we put them in a bag, yeah. and throw the bag. That's right. That was marshalling. <laughs> That's right. It was, yeah. it was an awesome moment. Um, do you have any of those um, really important moments in your life? Yeah, I mean, there's lots of important moments. Uh, from a, you know, bat, you go back to that time. I spent a lot of time watching the presenters that I loved. That I'm like, I'm, but you get in that analysis. Why do I like this so much? guys like Ken Getz, you know, but a mutual friend of ours. It's like, what is it about Ken's style that I enjoy so much? So I wanted to emulate those things too. Not his comedy. Yeah, <laughs> some fun, you know, funny is good, but, but also just a storytelling style. Yes. Just, you know, take people along for a ride. You never got lost, you followed him the whole way. Absolutely, but I also was very aware that it's often true, especially in technology presentations, that there can be an air of, I'm the smartest guy in the room, and if you don't understand this, it's because you're not smart enough. It's not my failure, it's yours. And guys like Ken never did that. You know, mm. I, I really, that bothers me a lot. Because it, it's not true. You can learn this if you want to learn it. It takes an effort. And so to be inviting to it and say, come with us, it's going to be great. Don't worry, right? There's lots to know, but you'll figure it out. I, much, I prefer that style over any other style. Let's move along to .NET Rocks. Oh, yeah. So you become a regional director, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I, you meet Carl. Yep, met him in a conference in Montreal, 2004. And uh, he was doing .NET Rocks by himself. And no, he had a co-host. Oh, that's right, yeah. Mark Dunn. Mark Dunn for the first 50. When I met him in 2004, Mark had retired, and Rory Blythe was the co-host at that time. Right. <laughs> That was never going to last too long. It was great. It, it was his own thing, right? The show changed. If you go watch, listen to those shows, because we're before podcasting, right? Yeah. It was very much an exploration of what does a show look like. Now, it had evolved into like a two and a half hour variety show that had an interview, some comedy, some uh, music, like it was a lot of different things. And so it was too much. Like in the end, when I got involved with the show, we sort of cut it down and said, well, we're gonna, we're gonna make a comedy show and you can do the music stuff over here and we'll go and just have a focused interview, which is that was what .NET Rocks became. And was some of that, some of the reasoning of doing that because some people would say, I don't want to listen to comedy, I just want to hear the tech yes. part. Well, it, 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 I drew a Venn diagram, right? I said, there's folks who like the comedy. There's folks that like the, te the, the tech. The intersection is small. Let's just pull them apart. Then we'll have more people that like everything. And, and you know, it's just an insight that more shows, more shorter shows are better than one giant show. And so it's, that's where, where Donna Rocks and Mondays came from. Right. And when you started, did you plan on doing like 50 shows or did you plan on doing Planned on doing 50 time? shows because right. Mark Dunn had done 50 shows, Rory Blythe did 50 shows. So I'm like, I'll do 50 shows. Can't be that hard. Do 50 shows. It's one show a week. Like one year, I'll be done. Missed it by this much. You've done like 1,500, haven't you? Yeah. This much. <laughs> <laughs> Plus 500 uh, run as radios. Oh, yes. Well, you know, I realized... I got hit, hooked on writing, like what I, and I realized later, I, I really got hooked on with storytelling. I like storytelling. And I, was, I wrote copious amounts. But you, you know, that industry, the magazine industry was dying around the time that I got involved with the podcast. And so 
dialing back the writing and dialing up putting the energy into podcasting. It's just scratching the same itch, telling good stories, right? Being the facilitator of stories. That is a pleasure for me. So I, I can't imagine not doing it. I'd have to do it another way if I wasn't doing it this way. It would have to be a pleasure. I'm just trying to do the calculations. If you did one episode every single day, which would be impossible, you'd be doing that for five years straight. Well, we typically record four shows in a day. Right. Right. So I'll, I mostly do the planning around, although three shows most of the time, a four show, get, you get a little punchy. And so what you, do you mean punchy? Like you get tired. Oh, right. it's, it's hard to do <laughs> record four shows in a day. And so, yeah, you, you, you schedule them up in blocks. I don't like traveling if we don't have the shows in the can already. So we block up, we get shows done. We, we pretty much had all of the summer shot in June. Uh, we, uh, with the, between NDC, uh, Oslo, and a few other things, we got a lot of shows in the can so that, you know, here I am and I don't have to worry about the, the shows that are, they were already recorded. But don't you need them to be topical? Absolutely. But summertime's a good time to get ahead because a lot, a lot happens in the summer. Right. So I don't get, I tend to get no more than a month or so ahead on the right. shows, but yep. a month's about, about right. Okay, of all those shows, mm -hmm. I don't have time to watch all 1,500. I would listen to them since they're podcasts. They're kind of boring for your eyes. <laughs> 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 you got me. All right. Tell me the top few and why. Well, that's a tough call. And what makes a good interview? I think first you have to tell me which of your children is your favorite. <laughs> It's the same problem, my friend. Like it's, how do you pick? There are shows I'm super proud of yeah. and shows I'm less proud of. Uh, you know, I'm, I love the fact that show number 10, which I wasn't even on, still gets downloads. It's the show with Chris Sells explaining how garbage collection works in .NET because the guy wrote it. He was part of the team that created garbage collection. So his explanation is definitive. And that's right. really, to me, kind of powerful, right? The technology shows, I mean, you, you get into a routine. We've, I'm always interested in what shows resonate. You know, we did a show in the 400s, I believe, called Is Technology Too Complex? Or Is Software Development Becoming Too Complex? And it was at a time in like 2007, 2008, where the market was very fragmented. We had WPF and WPFE and wind forms, and it, we didn't know what stack to grab onto. And, and they started going out of band with updates, so you didn't even know what you needed to install on a machine to do modern development. And so it was one of those shows, we did it as a panel discussion in a, 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 a weekend conference, I think it was in Kentucky. And I've done lots and lots of panel discussions. And this was a panel discussion where about halfway through, the audience took over where the lineup of the microphone suddenly got really long and the questions got very detailed. And it was now, even the, we were all on a ride at that point. Like you kind of lose control of your own creation. That's a great moment. And so that, that recording got downloaded a lot. It was just one of those very interesting shows. And it reflected a crisis, one that I think passed, and although maybe recurring again, uh, in what it was like to be a .NET developer. So, that, I mean, I thought that was a very exciting show. But, I mean, if you want to pull out my favorite shows, they're the geek outs. But that's me exercising my brain in a different way. And right. that we'll pro we're looking to spin the geek outs out to be their own show. All right. Yeah, it's about and time for that. And which, which of your favorite uh, geek outs are there? <laughs> yeah, they, so the geek outs were really shows about whatever geeky subject the audience wanted and uh, learning how to make those was interesting. So the first time we, we made space shows at first, because that was Carl's idea, I hated it, but he talked me into it, and then people loved it, so we made some more. But as I started taking questions you know, from the listeners, and they said uh, there was a big push on alternative energy. That's great, I love the subject, but I'm trying to figure out how to tell it well. You know, it's the difference between understanding how solar power works and telling it well. And if we actually started pulling together all of the pieces of alternative energy, I, I sort of backed up and said, I think we need to explain the fundamentals of electricity. And uh, which is not a show that anybody asked for, but I felt like it was foundational material for us to talk about. I wanted to go from you know, Volta and the fundamental physics of electricity to the modern power grid. Can I get there in an hour? Because once you understand that, then we can talk about, well, what's the problem with solar power? And why do we need a smart grid? And, and why do we need base load uh, energy sources and so forth? Like, that, that's all foundational mm -hmm. to that. That show was a stretch. I mean, fun, it was fun for me as a guy who got educated in electricity at a very young age 
to go and, and read up on the modern thinking about what electricity is. The role of the photon versus the role of the electron and so forth. And I, I created a big stink about it because it was different than the way I remembered it as well. Uh, but I got emails from grade school teachers saying, hey, thanks for the show. We do a section in our science about electricity and I send them home with your MP3 file. Listen to this before you do the class because it'll help you understand, you know, why a dimmer buzzes on the wall and you know why what's the problem with mm -hmm. fluorescent lights versus re incandescent lights because that's all stuff we talked about in that show so that made me really happy i i enjoyed that wow um you just did uh, a talk about the history of dot net mm -hmm. which to a degree is a history of all the people at microsoft and what they've done and how the whole dot net story has evolved sure yeah. um uh, have you got any great interviews w that you've done with Microsoft people such as um, Guthrie or Terry Myerson or Brian Harry or any of those guys that you really loved? I, um, I mean, I've interviewed Scott many times. I mean, he's in a, and, uh, and I th I'm very fond of him. He and I have, have spent a lot of time together uh, in one capacity or another. Um, I am really happy with the interview we did with Soma Sagar. Because mm -hmm. he's not, he's not a stagey kind of guy. Mm -hmm. He's not a performer type, I, but but very loved inside of Microsoft. He's left mm -hmm. now. He yes, works for yes, a company yes. called Madrona now, but loved by Microsoft. And I thought we captured that in that interview with him. Right. Um, he's, you know, when you get to that level at Microsoft, you move stock prices with things you say, and so they put a PR team around him. It makes it very protective. Now. Folks know that know Carl and I know that our job's not to move the stock price. We're not looking to, is to have a scoop, so to speak. We're trying to understand the technology. That's really that's what we're about. And so PR people are worried about us because they see us as press. But with a guy like Scott Guthrie, he goes, no, they're my friends. We're going to do a show together. Leave us alone. And we do great shows together. Mm. With Soma, it was a bit more difficult. And so his PR people wanted a scripted show which is very normal, right? That's, that's the thing. When you're talking about a senior person at Microsoft, they want to know the questions in advance. They're going to plan out the answers. You know, you've got to be careful with the stock price. And that's not what we do. And, it, and we think it's a mistake. And I had watched a bunch of interviews with Soma and realized they were very stiff. And, and I thought one of the reasons is they were scripted. And so I basically pitched Soma on, look, I wanted this interview with you. I want to talk about, because he comes from a technical background. He's grown to be this leader inside of the organization, but he had a technical background. That's what I wanted to talk about. And it took a lot of convincing, not of him so much of his people. He in the end said, I want to do this. And we had the PR folks listening in during the recording so that they, we could calm them down. But it's such a fun interview with him. About 20 minutes into the original interview, and we ended up editing it for length. And, and he, when you saw him get more comfortable and he realized, like, we really are serious. That's about, he had a great time. And we just had a great conversation. Now, I think one of the most amazing pieces in that particular show, he talked about how Microsoft acquires companies. I mean, that was mm -hmm. one of his jobs. He had this pile of money. It's like, how do we provide value to the company through acquisition versus development? Said, I thought it was a really interesting conversation. And there's a side of Soma, I didn't think a lot of people outside of Microsoft ever got to see. So, I mean, I'm proud of that show, but it's an, you know, those senior leaders are so busy doing their job, you really get a chance to see what motivates them, what they think about in those jobs. Mm. Um, uh, uh, you, you're making me think about um how Soma survived in Microsoft and climbed the corporate ladder. Soma was a, a quiet Indian guy. Yes. He was not a, not a bold presenter. He was never filled the room with his personality. But if you ever spent time with him one-on-one, -on -one, you'd do anything you wanted. That's he, right. He had this very close personality. He still has that personality. Mm. But yeah, I understood. when I met him and really spent time with him, yeah, I totally understood how he did that. He's not the follow me marching out front thing. He's the arm around the shoulder. Here's what I think we should do. And you want to do it for him. And you, I love the fact that there are, there's different styles of leadership that work. Mm. And this was a different kind of leader, incredibly valuable to the organization. And so he's very compelling. right in the middle of um, Steven Sanofsky with the Windows 8 um, and Silverlight debacle, mm -hmm. and Scott Guthrie, and I assume that there must have been a lot of friction, a lot of fighting. That was a very He's challenging right in time. the middle of all that, and he comes out, as far as you can tell, 
unscathed, no, no problems. Yeah, I don't know how unscathed that actually is. You know, both those guys, and there were many more people involved in that whole discussion, and we, I, mean, I talk mm. about this in the history as well. Mm. You hit this point in 2010, 2011, the iPad is out and the market is fragmenting across different clients. Tablets are being defined in a new way. I mean, Microsoft had had tablets for years, but this was the breakout device that changed everything. And you've got different groups inside of Microsoft that believe in different ways forward. Like everybody's fighting to be successful, but they disagree on the path. But, and I think Soma stood right in the middle of that because a new version of Windows can't be successful without a set of development tools. And we'd always done it that way, if you mm. think about it. Microsoft had always shipped a new version of Windows, shortly after that with a new version of Office, and that showed you what apps were supposed to look like, then within a year or so they give you a set of dev tools so you can make an app that looks like Outlook. <laughs> right? Over and over and over again. Then that model broke down eventually, but you go into the disruption that was Win8, that we're gonna tabletify Windows. You know, I, Apple had it good, because Apple was starting from scratch. There was no legacy. It was a new operating system in a new way. There's only one way to get software. Everything had to be written new. And Microsoft, that's never been Microsoft's way. They always take care of the legacy. It's one of the reasons we stuck to them for so long. There's always a path forward for the customer, for the developer. And they were trying to do that while embracing tablet at the same time. That's really challenging. And so I think part of that battle was, is the best way to program a tablet C Sharp or JavaScript? You know, and, and you could see the argument taking place on the device. Why, where did WinJS come from? Well, if you're really gonna control Windows with JavaScript, you're gonna need a set of libraries. That's WinJS. You know, it, but the truth bears out. In 2012, when, when Win8 launches, what's in the App Store? C Sharp XAML apps. That's, right. That's what's in the App Store. Us, we filled that store up with those apps. And Microsoft is nothing if not pragmatic. It's like, well, that's what's getting written, folks. What are we gonna do? So C Sharp continued on. It's, it's the dev platform for the Windows stack. And, and Windows RT that came out at that point in time, mm -hmm. um, how were there, were, was Microsoft many decisions away from that being a success? I think, so the big part about RT was it was the ARM architecture. Yep. So, and that was, I mean, ARM originated in Intel, or they sold it to Texas Instruments. They didn't, they stuck with the, with the AX86 line rather than go over to what ARM would become. I always felt that Microsoft grabbed onto ARM because they just needed better battery life and efficiency. Mm -hmm. And if Intel wasn't going to deliver it, they, would, they were capable of going to another platform. And, and we as .NET developers were beautifully positioned for that. It was easy to slot in a compiler to ARM, you know, rather than a compiler to x86. We, that's the great abstraction that is uh, the .NET framework and the, and the CLR. So confronted with that reality, I think the real reason that, that ARM and RT died down is that Intel got their act together. The next set of chips were far more power efficient and smaller and, and cooler, and so they made good tablet devices. And you don't have to recompile everything or figure out how to make everything work across. There was just no reason to proceed with ARM. Mm. Did you ever interview Sanofsky? Never did. Met him a couple of times. Did you try? I didn't ask. I, I, you know, it's a .NET show. He didn't seem to be very pro.NET. <laughs> Just, just saying. You're pretty perceptive. I, I know. <laughs> I got him to sign my book, and I, and I think I had a lunch with him once. He, he did an all, I, I, I like, select group, and he was, uh, you know, I have a lot of respect for Steven Sanofsky. The man shipped a lot of software. He yeah. ran Office. There's sort of two philosophies when it comes to shipping software. Do you slip the date or slip the features? Right? That's what it really comes down to. And Sanofsky, what's, what's your position on that? I, I'm a slip the feature. I, I, I'm a slip the date guy. Yeah. I think the feature set's ultimately the most important thing. And, and you know, Scott Guthrie, I think, is a slip the date guy too. He'd rather the important features than anything else. Steven Sanofsky was a slip the feature guy. It's like this is the date I will kill who needs to be killed to deliver on that date. And he made the trains run on time for office. That's what he did. And you cannot deny that he cleaned up Windows and made a great version of Windows in Windows Seven. You know, 7 was a very compelling version of Windows. And then he took on something tremendously hard 
and I think encountered a lot of resistance and uh, a lot of conflict around what eight was supposed to be. And, uh, and so eight was a struggle. You know, they ended up where it ended up. But uh, you, can't, you can't deny the legacy of what he delivered. You know, many versions of offices, Office, a couple of really important versions of Windows. Like that, there's not a lot of people who could do that. Mm. It's, a, it's a remarkable skill to marshal thousands of people to pull in a direction, and he did it. Mm. Do you know why Stephen Sanofsky didn't allow developers to uh, use the ribbon? Why did he come up with that, l that Yeah, legal I'm never, that's a great, if I was to interview him, I think that'd be one of my first questions because uh, it broke that model I just described earlier, right? Of the whole, we get a new version of Windows, we get a version of Office and tools to make stuff that looks like Office. And then when the ribbon came out in 2007, he's like, nope, the ribbon's special. It's only for, win for, for Office, you know, nowhere else. And then he backed off on that eventually and you could get a special license for it but it just wasn't the same. And of course, the silly part about that is how long did it take for the third party vendors to build their own versions of the ribbon? Mm. Here, you want it? You know, you can get it from DevExpress or Telerik mm. or, or you know, Component One or any one of those guys had their own version of that. So, I don't know, it, it's an odd thing, but I remember it happening and I, I, I didn't seem to make any sense at the time. Right. Um, what were your worst episodes on .NET Rocks? And names, please. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I did a couple of shows with this Australian. <laughs> he, was, he was all about rules and oh, they were terrible. I didn't even know why I published them, honestly. Uh, have you not had one bad episode? Come on, tell us. I have had shows where in the end it seemed inappropriate to publish them. And, and so shows that we didn't publish. Uh, we prefer, you know, we care a lot about the quality of the work. And when a, when a show's not going well, it just seems foolish to continue. Well, I, being perfectly honest, show 400 is a bit of an embarrassment. Why? We were very drunk. <laughs> <laughs> That's the correct answer. So the zero, zero shows, I mean, like Carl was one of the first people to ever make 100 episodes of a podcast. I was a guest on 100. That's where they announced me as becoming the co-host. But I had made 100 podcasts in 2005. That's crazy. And so the odd odd shows were always a big deal, right? And they still are. I mean, we, now that we've done 14 of them, but uh, so I was, uh, I was the guest for show 300. 200, we did this sort of game show thing with all the co-hosts and it was a lot of fun. 300, he said, why don't you, why don't I interview you? And it's when I sort of tell all and tell a lot of story stuff. In 400, we were in Montreal we, had, we weren't happy with any of the odd, odd ideas, and we were running out of time, and we literally recorded it in a bar in Montreal, and we were drunk, drunk. And I don't get drunk, drunk that often. We were drunk, drunk that night. And then it, it's that, and that's not a big deal. The big deal is we published that piece of mess. So <laughs> I think we did apologize for that show. And it's still up, I haven't taken that accident down either. So if you want to pick on it, pick on us. So I, I assume, um, to have a better experience listening to podcasts, the podcast app matters. Yes. Uh, with the iPhone, I think pretty much everyone uses that podcast built-in app. Yes. But with the Android story, like just in my office, there is some people using Pocket Cast, Pocket Addict, Overcast, Beyond Pod. There's Do a ton of them. Is there a favorite one? No, they all suck. Um, <laughs> and we even put out, we had worked with a company out of Latvia that wanted to put out .NET Rocks branded versions of the apps. And we did it, I think they're still out there. I'm very, it, it taught me a lot about how hard it is to maintain a mobile app because they break all the time. And, and you know, this was a tit for tat thing where we, we gave them advertising in exchange for the work, but you know, you can never stop working on a native app or, you know, it, and so it just wasn't fair and the apps have sort of fallen by the wayside. Uh, I'm actually invested in a company, a startup, that's trying to fix podcasting. They, they are called Greta. Uh, and they, that's exactly the issue, one of the issues we're addressing. And, and you know, the, my big think around that is we have this challenge where what we love about podcasting is the time-shifted element. You get to listen when you want to listen. Mm. But it's very hard to, to interact on a time-shifted way as well. So that's something we're working on at, at Greta is to try and make better connections so that the audience can connect more effectively with the creator around the, the creation. Do you get stats on whether people are listening 
at a double speed or like in my office, some of them are listening at 1.5. That's why I talk so slowly. Two. Yes, and, and the, I've even got one guy in the office who listens at three times speed. Does he take drugs? No, but Maybe I, should. I don't believe you can assimilate all the information. It's a, very, it's a very interesting question as to how quickly you can take it in. And you know, we recognize that most of our listeners are listening on their commute, yes. you know, on the train or while they're driving and things like that. So we deliberately use a talk show format where we, we recap on a regular basis so that you can be distracted and still follow along. And for some people that pacing is very frustrating, so they try and speed it up. But it's just like, we don't do that by accident. It's completely intentional hmm. um, because we, we do want you to still be able to follow along. But I think it's also, you know, the side effect of that is I realize that I, people have had my voice in their ears in a lot of their personal spaces inside their car and in their home and so forth. And it establishes an interesting relationship that they, they know a lot about my basement. You know. <laughs> You, that's like less than a minute out of any given hour of a show. And people still know a lot about my basement. So I'm okay with that. I keep mentioning my basement, but yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting effect. And but when everyone, someone asks me, is my basement done? I'm like, what is done exactly? What does that mean? What is anything done? Well, it looks pretty done to me. My basement's not done. <laughs> <laughs> so um, moving along, you created a run as radio. So yes. essentially you were doing a .NET Rocks for devs, yep. and you were doing a runners radio for sysadmin. Yep. You, were, you were kind of doing this before DevOps was a term. It's now yeah. a defined term. Mm -hmm. um, I started, I started run we? as in April of 2007, and uh, John Allspa says the word DevOps for the first time in 2009 at the uh, Velocity Conference in a, for by O'Reilly. So yeah. And where are we with, with DevOps? It's a loaded term, but where are we in the cycle now? Um, we, I think we're climbing out of the, the disillusionment trough. You know, people are starting to realize that DevOps, just like Agile, is not something that come in a spray can. Like here, squirt this on your developers, they'll go faster, right? It, <laughs> it turns out it's a little bit more complicated than that. Uh, and you know, bad, hard enough to get a team of developers to communicate with each other mm. effectively to do the right thing. Now you're asking everybody involved in the software to communicate together to do the right thing. It's challenging. The, I mean, the saving grace is that the results are so compelling that when a team really pulls tightly together and values the same thing, they get tremendous results. So uh, I think we, we are in this, the two aspects of DevOps I see that are very significant right now is A, we're well into the what they call the horses movement so for a long time we said, well, DevOps practices are for unicorns, right? The, the, mm. the Netflix of the world, they can do that. We'll never make that work here. And so that was, okay, well, not just for unicorns, it's for horses too. And so guys like Gene Kim uh, have really facilitated showing regular companies build, putting together these practices that make better software. Uh, the other aspect I think is important is that we're getting well beyond dev and ops. That's not, that's not all the people that are involved, that it is your security guys, it's certainly your testers, it's the analysts that are supposedly building requirements uh, around that, and, it, and the customer as well. How does, you know, the, in the end, this is all about a rapid feedback loop mm -hmm. through everyone, and so you can include the customer in that feedback loop. The only way for the customer to sort of comment on your app is to write a nasty gram in Twitter, that's not a good feedback loop. Like, we should be able to do that a little tighter instrument the app more effectively, allow that feedback to come in there so that it can influence the product going forward. And I think you're seeing more and more the tooling making it easier for us to include everyone that influences the app uh, into the loop. But tools aren't going to save you, right? This is a people process problem, actually. The tools are getting bloody good. They are. App Insights, New Relic, there's a whole series there's of a, them. There's a ton of them, and, and it lowers the bar. It means less effort, but you know, it's still your foot. You could shoot it off with a fancy tool, right? And folks that are selling DevOps in a box, that stuff bothers me because if you don't change the practices that allow people to actually work well together, and, and more, more than anything, like to really get the value from a DevOps practice is to allow us to study failure. It's not that we want to fail a lot, it's that we want it, the cost of failure to be extremely low. But you can only get there if you can allow failure at all. 
And there's plenty of cultures inside of companies where the word failure is a job limiting thing. It's like dust off your resume, you're done. And if you can't get over that, if everybody is constantly covering themselves, you just can't go fast, right? Being able to iterate rapidly is to be able to identify where things are going wrong, talk about it openly, and fix it. But as long as that's looked on as a failure that costs someone their job, nobody's going to talk about it, and you'll never get better. Are you a believer that teams should be deploying mostly to production and using feature flags to accelerate that process? Uh, I don't think it's that simple. The advantage of the feature flag approach is there's an awful lot of testing that is very hard to simulate, right? I've built a ton of load tests over the years, right? I worked through the dot-com boom on the web and so forth. And the problem is that humans are weirder than load test tools. You can never perfectly simulate reality because because humans are weird, man. They do evil things. They open five browsers and click refresh on all of them at the same time, like stuff I've just never been able to do in a load test tool. And load test tools can answer A, B questions. Is version A faster than version B? But they can't answer, will we survive Saturday? Right? Which is really what most people want the answer to. The whole feature flag approach is the ability to dip your toe of a feature into reality and see what it does. Turn it on, collect an hours worth of data, turn it off. Don't show it to the customer, it's for us to understand. What's the impact of this new feature? How does it behave? You know, an ultimate manifestation of a feature flag is an A-B test. Let's put up two versions and half the people see this and half the people see that, but only on this one server, the other ones aren't affected. So that kind of granularity so that we can look at the results and say, how do we make this better? So part of feature flags in my mind is there's, there's some testing that can only be done in the wild and get the truth. You can make up stories all day long. I should know. I'm a professional storyteller. I will give you a story. <laughs> I will cover it in data that seems impressive. It's just not right. The only truth is out in the wild. Right? And those tools are about providing us ways to collect truth without doing harm. Right? Just collect enough data to know something and then get it turned off so we can keep working. That's what's powerful about that approach. I remember when uh, we completely got it wrong. We uh, with year 2000, we had a there's a huge party down here and uh, without all our fireworks, but we all had to go back on the 31st back to the office because we all believed that there were going to be clients calling left, right, and center, brand new clients, everyone in disaster. We didn't get a call. Right, <laughs> it was unbelievable. And of course, you guys had year 2000 first. Yes. So I'm on the other <laughs> side of the date line. <laughs> Working with uh, Ken Talistad right. and uh, at Eclipse, and uh, we had written the software that ran the container traffic for the Port of Vancouver. So we were considered a critical asset, and they wanted to know that Y2K was going to be okay. And so we had committed to we weren't going to go out for Y2K. Our wives were not happy with us, but we were monitoring the software and waiting for the world to end. But we're at the end of the cycle. You're at the beginning yes. of the cycle. So somewhere around like eight o'clock at night. When most of the world is now across the threshold and it's like the place isn't on fire, we finally went, we should go out. And at the last minute, we found uh, a, a New Year's Eve party that we could book and told the wives, get dressed up, let's go. And we all, we managed to see, to be <laughs> out for New Year's on Y2K. And yeah, nothing happened. I think we dodged a bullet. We, that was a lot. I made a ton of money in 98 and 99 yeah. <laughs> fixing software. Like, Y2K bought me my house. Like, it's a, it was a very good business cleaning up that software. It was, yes. Exactly. And if we hadn't done it, I think we'd be in a total... I mean, I don't think the world would have ended, but I think we would now be a regulated industry. Right? Like, which maybe we should be. We were pretty important to the world right now. We're still not really an engineering discipline. And uh, Y2K could have been that tipping point. It's just that we got away with it. Your podcast. Uh, I assume now that bandwidth has is not an issue anymore. Yeah. Why aren't you doing video rather than podcasts? Because most of my listeners listen on their commute. I can have their ears, I can't have their eyes. But they could watch the screen optionally. Well, then they would die, and I, that reduces the number of listeners, right? Like that, <laughs> this is purely for my benefit, right? <laughs> I don't want to kill my listeners. As it is, I get emails on a regular basis saying, I had to pull over because you made me laugh that hard, cry that hard, rage that hard. Right, so uh, no, you know, we had DNR TV, 
back in the day. Before, right. before Pluralsight came along, we were doing DNR TV, and it was about one-tenth of the popularity. And I sort of acknowledged the reality then that the power of podcasting is that it can be done with other things, that it is something that utilizes time that's otherwise unutilizable. That it's a very different commitment to say, I'm going to stop everything and focus on X, as opposed to while I'm driving, mowing the lawn, working out, ignoring my children, put in a <laughs> pair of headphones, you know, and listen to a podcast. So it, 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 was, a con it was a conscious decision to stick with audio, that, that, was, that reached a larger group of people in a different way. I think Carl and I have found a style that works well for audio, mm -hmm. and uh, that video would be a different product. Um, the example you give us of DNR TV, that was a long time ago. Yep. That was with bad bandwidth. We certainly didn't have iPad apps or, yeah. or YouTube apps where you could say, make offline, just watch easy, carry a little. That, that is not the issue, right? The, the issue is the, the focus time, right? And the con you know, what we, we realized, the content density was different when you went to do the video. Uh, the focus was different, right? DNR TV did very well. It covered, in, a, in an hour, it would cover about as half as much as material as .NET Rocks would. And it tended to be used in lunch and learns. That, the, that folks mm. would get together and watch one while they ate their lunch and they'd talk about it afterwards. Like, we were proud of the product, mm. it was a good product, but it was a fundamentally different product from what .NET Rocks was. So, I wouldn't stop the podcast, I'd make something else. And is the podcast growth growing, or yes. is it dissipating? No, it's growing again. Um, podcasts have undulated. They've, the market's gotten bigger, the market's gotten smaller, it's harder to use, it's easier to use. You know, for a long, in the early days, we made it a lot. The original deployment model of .NET Rocks was files you burned onto CDRs to play in your car, right? And we came, we, for a while there, we were sharing them via BitTorrent because bandwidth was expensive. Uh, then we were putting them out in AAC and like four different audio formats. These days, it's just an MP3 file. It's back to simple. It's the, it's what people seem to want, and as I think, well, there's a certain amount of effect for podcasting's waning and waxing. I think that .NET's wane and wax has mattered too. Not that we're a show necessarily about .NET. We're really a show about .NET developers. So I think the, the happiness of the podcast has been reflected by the happiness of the community. So in the darker times of .NET, there were fewer listeners. This is a pretty happy time for .NET and the listeners grow every month. All right. And uh, obviously, you mentioned before that you're investing in a better podcast experience. Um, I'd love to know some of the things that you are thinking of making better. Well, there, I mean, uh, I'm invested in a startup company that's trying to make a better client, and that's a, that's a whole other conversation. At the same time, for .NET Rocks itself, we're modifying our back end. You know, we started so early, well, Carl started so early, that he built all the software that runs the podcast. But as podcasting has become much more mainstream, uh, people's expectation, by, the sponsor's expectation around the podcast are different now. So for a long time, we were sort of a unique product that was paid for separately and we could do what we wanted. Today, we're part of an overall digital marketing strategy and so people have different expectations. So, I mean, what, the most important change that you'll see coming in the next uh, year or so is, we're now going to be able to dynamically replace the advertising in the show. Oh. Now, why is that important? Well, one thing is, right now, I only get paid for a show when I put out a new show. Right? I sell a new ad in a new show and the ad persists forever. That's good for the advertiser, not necessarily good for the listener. You go listen to a show from three years ago, and there's an offer from a sponsor that you'd really like, but you can't have it anymore because it's from three years ago. That makes people unhappy. But more importantly, my back, I don't do enough with my back catalog because I don't have current ads in it anymore. So the fact that I can replace that advertising with a current ad means that I can cultivate my back catalog. I, I should, I have the entire history of Silverlight in the set of shows. It should be sorted in a way where you can grab it and enjoy it. I should have a set of beginner shows. All of the shows, oh, so you're new to, to ASP.net, here's what you should listen to, right? And pull all those things together. But by being able to replace those ads, I can pay someone to do the curation to maintain that stuff. So. We're, these new engines that we're putting in place allow us to get more value from the shows that we currently got and not have to constantly make 
repeat ourselves over existing topics. Mm. So we'll make a better show in the next couple of years. Wow. We can do more with it. That's awesome. So you go back to all your old videos and put them through the new engine and they'd yes. be... Ha but I would listen to them, not watch them. Because... <laughs> <laughs> just saying. I just thought of a great idea. You know, this video, this... This uh, interview now is mm -hmm. being live streamed. Yes. And it's on uh, Facebook. And as people like a certain answer you do, they all press like, love hearts pop up and things yep. like that. Um, if you had that in your podcast, you could go to a certain spot where people have loved. And I, I'm, I'm absolutely interested in that. I also, uh, the number of times I get email from folks saying, hey, I was listening to one of your shows, but I can't tell you which one. And you had this person on who was talking about this cool thing that I really like, but I don't know what it's called. Can you tell me? <laughs> so I really like a player where when you heard something like that, you hit a button and there's an email waiting for you at the office that says, hey, you were listening to this show at this time. We were talking about this. Here are the links, right? Awesome. To actually allow you to curate the information you value most from the show. So uh, yeah, that's something I'm thinking about. Last two questions, Rich. Okay. Uh, the humanitarian toolbox, mm -hmm. what's your involvement and what's your desire to happen with that? So HT Box came out of the 2012 road trip. So uh, for years, Microsoft would support us going out on the road in an RV across the United States, talking about the new version of Visual Studio. And 2012 was the largest of those tours. We did 34 cities in 13 weeks. We drove across the US twice. But during the planning of that tour, the uh, folks that we were working with said, we really like to have a charitable component of the tour. And I was frustrated with how hard it was for software developers to, to donate their skills to charity. We've done give camps and, and things like that where developers would get together for a weekend and write some code for the charity of their choice. And that's fine, except that you have to live with the code, right? I mean, the dev gets to go home at the end of a couple of days. The charity has to live with whatever you make. And now, if someone gets engaged enough the charity, they continue to donate. Because we, we all know that software, even when you give it away, is not free. Software is free the same way a puppy is free, right? There are, there are consequences to having a puppy. And software's like that. It needs care and feeding. So if you're not, if the, nobody around to build the software, it's kind of stuck. And so being able to continually contribute is an important part of the equation. So this was the beginning of the thinking around that. And I actually have the one note I was writing at the time uh, about the, exactly this idea of how do we make sustainable software? How do we make it work everywhere in the world? So something international, not US centric, not Canadian centric, not Aussie centric. Uh, and how do we uh, uh, sustain it long term? Like what, what does that really look like? So humanitarian toolbox was a recognition that disaster response can really use technology to get better, that we're certainly able to build it. And that if we use open source and cloud together with mobile, we build software. I mean, disaster response is the perfect cloud scenario. You need a lot of compute for a short amount of time to help those disaster response workers be more efficient. And then when they finished, you can wind it back down. Uh, making it open source projects just meant that anybody could work on it, anybody can use it. And one of the hardest things I saw in GiveCamps is you had to pick which charity got an app. I hated that. Like, why? Anybody can use it. You want my software? It's on GitHub. Knock yourself out. I can't even stop you. Why would I? Download it and use it. Now, along comes Microsoft Philanthropies, who's basically saying, how much Azure would you like, right? And so we're running software on behalf of charities in certain circumstances as well, which helps them too, because again, what are we good at? You know, we're software people. Whether that be development or operations, it's all the same thing. We don't do the work, right? In most businesses, we're not the people that make the money. We build the tools that help the people that make the money be productive. We're staff, they're a line. Same thing in disaster response. I've worked with a bunch of disaster relief workers. They're remarkable people. They're the line that saves lives in these disasters. That's not me. But I can help them build tools that make those guys more productive so they're on the ground sooner, they can find people that need help sooner, save more lives, get things cleaned up, get people back to their regular lives. That's the best thing I could be doing. So that's the motivation. 
And so it t it's taken time to put all the pieces together. It's really, I know how to lead teams and build software. I don't know how to be a charity. I've been learning to be a charity. <laughs> So we, we set ourselves up as a, as a 501c3, as an American charity. We're, we're starting to look at, at, at being qualified in other countries, using different rules in different places. But in the end, it's been the same thing. Folks want to do this, right? This is something they want to do, but they don't want to waste their time and they don't want to do harm, right? They don't want to make the situation worse. So our responsibility from an operations perspective for HT Box is we're doing the project management. We work with the organizations that, that have the need for the software. We figure out the right work items. We do everything through a GitHub workflow. We just create work items that are the requirements and ask developers, hey, look, look at these items. If you see one you like, talk to us about it. We'll let you take it on, make your contribution. You add to this project. We do the back end testing, take it out into the field and put that app in the field and help people with it. So you can work on the stuff you're good on, we work on the stuff we're good at, we can make a difference. And I can see us, you know, the bigger picture on this is I want us as a species to get better at responding to these natural disasters because there's more of them. So why shouldn't we be able to measure from one to the next? We're on the ground sooner. We're getting people into safety. We're building and restoring things so that people get back to their lives. So. It takes good tools, tools that'll be able to do those measurements. That's the big picture on that. There's so much software to write in that space. So that's been the inspiration. It's been a few years. I've had a great team around us and literally hundreds of developers have contributed to it. It's, it's amazing what you're trying to do. Do you think that you will rely on um, donated time for the majority of the project? I have no problem with donated development time. Lots of it. In fact, I'm holding back running more codeathons in more places. That is not my, my, my gate is project management, is making sure we're organized enough to not waste the developer's time. They can make the contributions they need to do. So we try, we worked with volunteer project management for a while, but it just takes a focus. So now we've been spending the donated funds on professional project managers to run the project effectively. And that to me is very leverageable money for what it, what it costs to have one project manager managing a half a dozen projects, I make literally hundreds of developers productive and efficient and a half a dozen programs move at the same time. So it's been a very workable solution. It's taken time to get that model worked out. My final question, Rich, you're quite the chef. Mm. You've made many a dish, many an awesome dish. I like theatrical food. I like a good show. <laughs> I should work at Benihana, that's me. <laughs> I remember, uh, I'm gonna ask you what your favorite dish is, but I remember, um, we, uh, when you came here about oh, 15 years ago, and one of the speakers, um, Peter Vogel, had organized us all to go to Tetsuya's. Yes, and that I, was a ton of fun. <laughs> you were hilarious. None of us knew it was a fine dining. I knew, <laughs> and I told Peter, I was like, look, fine dining, there's only some people, this is hot cuisine, right? This was literally like 12 courses, most of them not cooked. Very small too and not yeah. filling. Well, because if you've got 12 <laughs> big courses, you're going to explode, right? And I so said to Peter at the time, like, it, sh it should just be the four of us, right? Because my wife came along, his wife came along. Nope, invited a big group of people. And it was, I don't know, $400 a plate, something like that. Per person. Per person. I thought and it was they, for the whole table. Yeah, and, <laughs> and the cork, and they didn't have wine. You brought your own, and they charged you to open it for you. Uh, and you were appalled. That's the nicest way to say it. Well, I booked but it. But to your <laughs> credit, after he got over his shock and everything ended and so forth, the next day you took everybody that was at that meal and more out to a Thai place and spent less than one person paid at that place <laughs> That's right. for really decent Thai food. But I've done, I love that kind of thing. Like I love experiential food, but I have learned there's a small group of people who have that same appreciation and aren't particularly worried about just how much money we're spending on it. And so we do that. We don't invite you. <laughs> <laughs> and so what is your favorite dish? Favorite cuisine? I used to think it was barbecues, but... Well, barbecues a lot of different things too. So, I mean, I, I like uh, experiential food. There's a, there's a ton of fun to be had in any given dish. But, you know, I prefer, I like the art of something well executed, whatever that may be. Uh, I started making my own pastrami, uh, and that's about a month-long effort from we're going to make pastrami to we're eating pastrami takes about a month. 
And that's, uh, you don't work too hard for a lot of that sitting, waiting for the meat to pickle or smoke mm -hmm. and things like that. But yeah, it, it, that to me is, a, is a, my current high bar of tricky things to make. Because if you get it wrong, you die of botulism, which, you know, that's what I like, the threshold of food. Like, this is only going to be awesome, or we're all going to the hospital. I don't know which. Let's, let's try it. Of all the things you've, that I've seen you cook, my favorite was the bacon. I'm not even a bacon eater, but the bacon that once it got cooked had all this maple syrup in it. Oh, you like that, yeah. I, was, I thought it was amazing. That's it, a, well, in Canada, you can buy bacon with maple syrup, but I did not do I just cooked it, man. It came out of the package with the maple syrup. It was amazing. It. When you smell it, when it's cold, there's no smell. Yeah. When you cook it. It's full of maple syrup. Well, welcome to Canada. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, with that, um, thank you very much, Richard. My pleasure, it's friend. Been awesome. And did you want to take some questions? Uh, do we want to? If we have time. The microphone's there, folks. If you want to line up, I, I will happily. Let's uh, go, Rich. <coughs> uh, All right, man. This is, this is not going to be hard. Um, is the mic on? Yeah. I'm good. All right. Uh, so. Way back with the, if you remember, the Palm Pilot, the Newton, all those sort of things, we had the whole pen computing thing, the IPAC, yep. all that sort of stuff. And then that trend or that, that experience died. And now we see the pen coming back. We see it you know, with the surface and the, and the pencil, because that's new technology, because you have battery in it as well. Yep. Um, with that trend, you know, something comes up, it doesn't work, it disappears, and then it comes back again and it works. Do you see anything like that happening now with other technologies? Yeah, I think hollow, so the way I've always described that is, is it a Newton or an iPhone? Same company, right? Yep. They made the Newton, which was a, a PDA type device, uh, crazy way to use the pen to work it. They made it for a few years, it didn't catch on too far, they let it go. Then they make the iPhone, changes everything. And so that's always been my gauge when you look at new technology, Newton or iPhone. And so the, my question right now is, is the HoloLens a Newton or an iPhone? I don't know the answer, right? It's not that simple. Is it going to catch on? What are the compelling parts of it? I'll tell you what's not compelling is the current price tag. Uh, <laughs> it's an expensive toy, although that's not an automatic exit, right? I mean, people spend a lot on iPhones. Uh, maybe that's $1,000 versus $3,000, talking American dollars for the, for the HoloLens. The bigger issue, I think, with the HoloLens is that the field of view and the current version, which is now two years old, uh, is, has a restricted field of view, which I think is a, a non-trivial problem. Uh, it's got a relatively limited battery life, and it can handle sunlight. sunlight. Uh, I do, there, there's an argument right now in sort of future technology over whether it's going to be, what's going to disrupt the, the smartphone? Uh, and some folks are very much on the Amazon Echo side. They're calling it ambient computing. So the fact that the compute's just sort of in the room and responding to your needs typically via voice. Uh, I think that the visor represents the ultimate example of ambient computing in the sense that it's on your face. Now, that didn't work for Google Glass, right? That's why they started calling them glass holes. Uh, <laughs> but the reason what people make up their minds about a technology or a product sort of instantaneously and then they come up with excuses. The fact that there was the, the excuse against the Google Glass was that it had a camera on it, but I do believe that was an excuse. The bigger issue here was the Google Glass was simply not compelling enough of a product. You know, for a long time walking around with a smartphone out was considered unbearably rude. And, but we got over that. And we got over it because it was compelling enough we didn't compare we were, compare we were rude. And when somebody yelled at us about it, we just gave them a phone and then they walked around with one. Right? It worked very well. I did this with my family. My daughters both had smartphones. And they brought them to the dinner table. And this upset my wife. And so, and she's like, we well, need to ban smartphones from the table. It's like, before you do that, I gave her a smartphone. <laughs> then there wasn't an argument anymore. Everybody was happy. They were all on their phones at the table, right? It's about creating a social acceptance factor. I think when the visor is good enough that you don't care how dorky you look wearing it, it'll take off like a gunshot because the ability to be able to have a 3D view of the world through that set of sensors is essentially a connect strap to your face. And to have your data, I mean, why do you keep looking at your phone all the time? Because you're worried about missing out. Well, don't worry. It's right here all the time now. You'll be fine, right? That's the ultimate FOMO device. That it's, it's there. The elements are there. It's just a question of is it next year, the year after, the year after that? And who's going to go broke first trying to figure out what that is one way or the other? So, you know, the HoloLens has a lot of the ingredients. If the next version of this is as good as it should be, 
things are going to get interesting, and I think uh, I think it'll get disrupted. Got any other questions? But before I was in your other presentation about the history of .NET, mm -hmm. and as well as this one, I've meant, I, I, I happen to notice that when you talk about Microsoft, you happen to refer to them as we, yeah. even though you don't work for them. Never have. F that's fair enough. Anyhow, uh, what got you interested in Microsoft as opposed to any other tech company out there? Uh, I fir well, first started making money off of Microsoft technology in... I don't know, 81, 1980. So uh, they made the tools that allowed me to make a living, right? They built dev tools for a long time and uh, they made a terrible operating system that needed a lot of help to operate and that meant tech support and I got paid for tech support. So, you know, I was always working around them long before the Wintel hegemon and, and .NET and all of those things. This was just the business. You know, IBM PCs took off. The original IBM PC ship was CPM. Nobody really cared about PC DOS, but CPM's ability to handle hard drives was very difficult. And by DOS 2.11, when they mapped the hard drive to the C drive, it allowed you to boot from C, which was kind of a big deal because you used to only boot from A. First hard drives I put into IBM PCs, we actually had to configure them as the A drive so you could boot from them. It, it just was, it was a more compelling OS. So uh, I went there because it's where the money was. It's like if somebody, if somebody was going to pay me to goof around with technology, I was going to do it. I didn't do any work with them directly, but for a long time. But uh, it was always, they made the products that made me a living. So you kind of be nice to those people. It's hard to work without them. All right, we'll take one more question. I've got one more. Sure. Uh, we, all, we all know how bad Vista was. What, uh, what is the worst Vista story you have heard from the, from the customer base? So the, one of the mistakes I think that existed in Vista is the new, was the new network stack. They rewrote the TCP IP stack from scratch. Now there's a bunch of reasons. They, they wanted to have a good 64-bit stack. They they'd modified the 2003 one to be 64-bit. Like there was a big battle in there. So I think the evilest thing that was in Vista right off the bat that hurt a lot of people was the variable MTU size. So the RFCs for TCP IP talk about the ability to vary the size of the packet basically on demand. The default size is 1524, if I remember correctly. And most TCP IP stacks ever built only ever made 1524 size packets. And a lot of cheap network hardware can only handle a 1524 packet because you didn't need anything else. And so when Vista came out and by default had this variable size packet feature on, it would try to change the size of the packet and network gear would just tip over. It wouldn't be able to handle. Now, how do you tell what was going on? This, is, this was the evil thing, right? Is if you installed Vista on a workstation and you got onto the internet, it worked just fine for a while. Then at some point you did a file transfer or you download an image <laughs> or something that made the browser ask for a bigger packet size. And so it would try and create a bigger packet size to move the file along and the server on the other end could probably handle it, but your network router in between couldn't. And so you would just stop being able to communicate over the network. And you wouldn't know why. And then you reboot the machine and it would work again. Over and over and over. And the only way to turn that feature off was a net shell command. There wasn't a UI for it or anything. You had to know what it was. What it, the first thing we learned in those early versions, it was fixed by SP1. But before SP1, you had to go in and do this command line to turn off variable packet size. If you had like a WRT 54G Wi-Fi router, it could only handle 1524 packets. So it was just, it was awful. Like, and it, and it's, I mean, I'm a networking guy. I could figure that stuff out. How does my mother deal with something like that? She was the one who told me she didn't want Vista. I'm like, <laughs> how, how do you know? You're not, not a software person. So that, yeah, there's a bunch of stuff that went wrong with Vista. Not only did they run out of time, it also was the point where the hardware start, stopped advancing as quickly. CPU speed stopped increasing around then because it, you couldn't go faster without the, the, 
the CPU melting. We couldn't cool them enough. The coolers got huge. So they had anticipated faster hardware than what was actually delivered at the time. The uh, Intel had sort of gone off the rails with their RAM bus, and different designs. So the machines had didn't have as much capacity as they did. They had planned for a machine they didn't have. They had rewritten so much stuff that they largely didn't get a chance to test thoroughly. It was a convergence of things that ha that created all of the problems that live within Vista. And again, I, I said this in the session, the folks that really took Vista out for a spin first were the testers, right? Were the magazine writers and things. And they found all of those problems and scared everybody away. By the time Service Pack 1 came out and Vista was fine, people were too frightened of it to use it. And so it just sort of, it's like, we'll skip that version. And um, lots of people never touched it. They went from XP to 7. And there's also the NVIDIA problems that Microsoft were being blamed for. Well, they rewrote the driver model, right? That was all part of, of the new version of the Vista changed the entire driver model. And it's not, again, I don't think that NVIDIA did the wrong thing, but NVIDIA was simply overwhelmed. The brand new NVIDIA cards had good Vista drivers, but people were installing Vista on existing hardware and they wanted their video card to work. And, and NVIDIA tried to build a universal driver and it just wasn't that good. It was a hard thing to do to do all the older uh, video cards and so you had all these errors that occurred and it was all you know, part parcel of the problem uh, They if they'd had another year To really work on it. I think they would have wouldn't have been as much pain And that's where I get into this whole idea of if XP SP2 because it was a breaking version of Windows It broke software if they had called it version XP version 2 and it sort of reset that deadline they might have had more time to clean up the problems. I know why they called it Service Pack 2. It's because they wanted everybody to install it. And a Service Packer had more willing to install than a new version of an operating system. And then back then they sold new versions of the operating system. This was a way to give it away for free and get everybody to install it. So in that sense, they did the right thing, but it created problems down the line. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, I think we'll leave it at that. Thank you very much, Richard. Uh, a very, very special episode of our uh, Ask Me Anything at NDC Sydney. And uh, this is Adam Kogan signing off. Thanks.